Good morning. I'm going to talk about our effort in advancing our quality assessment to meet the challenges of increasing volume and complexity of regulatory submissions. It is important to first talk about the importance of pharmaceutical quality. In general, a quality product means that it consistently meets the expectations of the user. Drugs are no different. To understand the importance of pharmaceutical quality, it is necessary to relate pharmaceutical quality to patients' perspective. Specifically, patients expect safe and effective medicines with every dose they take. Pharmaceutical quality is consistently meeting standards and ensure every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination and defects. It is what gives patients confidence in their next dose of medicine. The Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, OPQ, within CEDA, oversees the quality of new drugs, generic drugs, biologics, biosimilars, and over-the-counter drugs. All of drugs applications have a quality or the so-called chemistry, manufacturing, and controls CMC session. One of the core functions of OPQ is to assess this session. Specifically, our assessors evaluate how product is designed, how it is manufactured, and the manufacturing facilities in order to ensure a safe and effective drug is being delivered consistently to intended patient population. OPQ also assesses product and manufacturing changes after a drug is approved to ensure quality is maintained. Although there have been noticeable improvements in the drug development and manufacturing arena, regulators are still facing challenges in assessing quality information in drug applications. The number and the complexity of the applications have increased significantly in the past few years. And at the same time, we are tasked to evaluate these applications in a shorter time with same resources. Every year, at OPQ, we evaluate on average more than 3,000 INDs, more than 200 new drugs and biologics applications, more than 900 generic drug applications, and more than 10,000 post-approval changes. One problem is that we receive all these applications as unstructured information in PDF files. As a result, our assessments are freestyle, unstructured narratives, in which a significant portion of the documents are summarization of information or copy and paste data from the submissions. Such a system poses problems because the risk assessment and evaluation of the applicant's mitigation approaches get dispersed in lengthy narratives. Oftentimes, there is inconsistency and ineffectiveness, as well as difficulty to share knowledge and manage FDA's information on approved drug products and facilities. Our decision-making capacity may not be optimized because assessors evaluate each application in relative isolation without fully assessing the wealth of information at FDA disposal. We soon realized that good knowledge management is essential. In the context of technology advancements, we cannot continue to assess quality through our traditional 
narrative based evaluations using unstructured test summarization of application information and copy and paste data tables. I would like to point out that these practices do not allow for easy knowledge sharing, management of quality across product life cycle, and overall modernization of assessment. Instead, in order to be most efficient, we want to take advantage of modern IT tools and platforms and emphasize structured data and the ability to capture critical information. This will move to highly specific, stored in a predefined format structured data, which will enable us to achieve a systematic approach to risk assessment resulting in a more consistent, high-quality evaluation and decision-making. And the idea here is based on efficient information exchange, knowledge management, and data analytics. At OPQ, we recognize the need to modernize our quality regulatory assessment, and we are currently taking steps to transform our evaluations from narrative information to structured data and systematic approach for risk assessment, powered by IT, so we can best capture and manage knowledge. This concept was envisioned in 2016 and discussed at the Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee meeting on September 20th, 2018, as CASA, an IT system that modernized FDA's assessment. As part of assessment modernization effort, we created CASA, a knowledge management system meant to modernize the assessment of drug applications. CASA stands for Knowledge Aimed Assessment and Structured Application. It is a database platform for structured quality assessments and applications that support knowledge management. We already have a fundamental knowledge base of the products, manufacturing processes, and facilities. And as new information come to us in applications, we want to be able to assess that information in conjunction with our existing knowledge and really achieve knowledge management throughout the life cycle of the drug product we evaluate. While CASA is a key driver, to fully achieve our vision of advancing quality assessment powered by information technology and multidisciplinary approaches. We must integrate CASA with other key OPQ initiatives or programs. These initiatives and programs include Quality Surveillance Dashboard, QSD, Integrated Quality Assessment, IQA, M4Q, and Pharmaceutical Quality, Chemistry, Manufacturing and Controls, PQCMC. And in next few slides, I will highlight what they are and explain how they relate or connect to CASA to provide a comprehensive approach enabling more effective and efficient quality assessment. CASA is a system that takes advantages of IT technology and innovation to modernize regulatory submission, assessment, and registration using structured data, advanced analytics, and knowledge management. CASA captures and manages knowledge, incorporates rules and algorithms for risk assessment and enables assessors 
to perform advanced analytics, resulting in a comprehensive and science risk-based structure assessment. Then, to maximize the benefits of CASA, we need information and data that are well structured and organized. This is where ICH-M4Q and PQCMC come into play. ICH-M4Q is currently under revision. It will reflect advancements in technology and regulatory approaches. So, it can continue to provide harmonized guidance on the content and organization of the quality information in an application across regulatory organizations. Then, CASA will use information from M4Q for quality assessment to facilitate approval and life cycle management and accelerate patients and consumer access to pharmaceuticals. For CASA to effectively use information from M4Q, we need PQCMC, which stands for Pharmaceutical Quality, Chemistry, Manufacturing and Controls. PQCMC is still under development. It provides a standard data elements and data exchange standards to the industry so that Future submissions will contain structured uh, quality information to be used by the CASA system. It is a critical enabler for M4Q implementation and long-term effective knowledge management. Therefore, to enable an efficient and effective quality assessment and fully take advantage of CASA, we need applications that incorporate both organization as defined by M4Q and data standards as defined by PQCMC. To assure seamless integration of all the relevant quality disciplines, in assessment of drug applications using CASA, we have integrated quality assessment teams and processes. In this context, the assessment is done by a multidisciplinary team, followed a defined business process with clear roles and responsibilities. And this figure shows the relationship of IQA with respect to CASA, M4Q, and PQCMC. An assessment of a proposed product should leverage relevant information available about the product and how and where it will be made, quality surveillance dashboard, QSD will augment CASA and really allow us to use current and historical information about both the facilities and the applicant in one place. Together with information from the application, we will be able to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the application by considering all relevant risk factors. I want to emphasize that using these advanced tools or systems are expected to enable us to do our quality assessment more effectively and efficiently by applying the same quality standards and at the same time improve the consistency of quality assessment. Among these tools, CASA certainly plays an important role in assuring the quality and consistency of our assessment. In this context, some key features of CASA 
worthwhile highlighting here are captures and manages knowledge across life cycle of a product, has built in rules, algorithms, and analysis to inform regulatory decision making, focuses on structure, regulatory quality assessment, and provides data integration with other FDA systems that I just mentioned. OPQ is focused on continuing CASA's development. Our vision over the next five years includes expanding CASA to just substances, including DMFs, new and generic drugs applications, all dosage forms for generic drugs, INDs, new drugs, and biologics applications, as well as post-approval uh, changes or supplements. I would also like to point out that in the November 2022 Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology as advisory committee meeting. We also gained uh, unanimous support from the committee for expanding the use of CASA from generic drugs to new drugs and biologics. In conclusion, CASA and other quality assessment initiatives that I just presented are driving innovation in our quality assessment, powered by our modern technology in uh, IT. I would like to thank our OPQ and CEDA staff, as well as CEDA leadership for their support of our modernization effort in quality assessment. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank for your attention. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Susan Kirshner, and I am the Director of the Division of Biotechnology Review and Research 3 in the Office of Biotechnology Products and Cedars. And I'd like to thank the conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss patient-focused specifications with you today. Before I launch into my talk, I'd like to give you a brief overview of what I will cover today. I'll begin with a discussion of patient-focused drug development as background, and then discuss specifications and provide some guiding thoughts about the selection of tests, analytical procedures, and acceptance criteria. <clears throat> and I'll close with a summary of what I've covered. Patient-focused specifications are a component of an end-to-end -end patient focused drug development process. And that process includes patient-focused drug development, the manufacturing control strategy, and mature manufacturing quality system. Patient-focused is about ensuring that patients' experiences, perspectives, needs, and priorities are meaningfully incorporated into decisions and activities related to their health and well-being. Patient-focused drug development is a systematic approach to help ensure that patients' experiences, perspectives, needs, and priorities are meaningfully incorporated into medical products throughout the medical product life cycle. Patient-focused drug development helps ensure the acceptability and usability of the drug by the patient and promotes appropriate use of the drug. In 2012, FDA established the Patient-Focused Drug Development Initiative to more systematically obtain patient perspectives on specific diseases. I now want to begin focusing on specifications and their role in the manufacturing control strategy. The manufacturing control strategy should be designed to ensure the quality of each lot of drug product, and specifications are just one component of the overall control strategy. Specifications are standards that the product must conform to prior to lot release. 
and they're used to confirm the quality of products, intermediates, raw materials, reagents, components, and process materials, container closure systems, and other materials used in product production. To develop patient-focused specifications, several things are needed. Firstly, the quality target product profile should be patient-focused in design to ensure that the product meets user needs. As such, the target product profile should ensure that the product is safe, pure, potent, and usable by the patients. Some examples of pure, poorly designed products that we've encountered include subcutaneous injection volumes that are too large to be delivered into a single site, so, most, so multiple injections are required to, live, to deliver a full dose, pills that are too large for patients to easily swallow, and syringes and auto-injectors that are difficult for impaired patients to use. Deve development of patient-focused specifications also requires that product quality attributes are well characterized. Attributes that are critical to the patient experience with the drug should be identified and their impact on the safety and effectiveness of the drug should be understood. Because biological products are mixtures of the desired product and process and product related impurities, the impact of all these components on drug product safety and effectiveness should be considered. Lastly, to develop acceptance criteria for specifications that focus more heavily on what is important to the patient and less heavily on manufacturing history, the manufacturing facilities where drugs are made should have mature quality systems that focus on outcomes that affect the patient or consumer. So now let's start talking more deeply about specifications. Specifications have three components. The test, which is about what attribute we are testing, for example, purity, impurities, and potency, the analytical procedure or method that will be used to evaluate the attribute being tested. For example, HPLC and SCC are common methods used to test for both purity and impurities, whereas bioassays are frequently used to test for potency. And the acceptance criteria that are used to decide whether to accept or reject a lot or batch. Acceptance criteria generally include numerical limits or ranges, or sometimes other criteria such as positive or negative if a threshold method is being used. Acceptance criteria also include the sampling plan, which is a description of which samples are going to be tested. As I just said, specifications are comprised of the test, the method, and the acceptance criteria. In the next four slides, I will discuss test and method selection, and then spend about eight slides discussing acceptance criteria and close with a brief case study. Test selection is product specific and should confirm the quality of the product. Furthermore, tests should be selected based on the quality target product profile. It's kind of a mouthful. For example, it is generally not necessary to test antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity when the target is soluble rather than membrane bound because ADCC doesn't happen under those conditions. As another example, the mechanism of action for some enzyme replacement therapies require that the drug be taken up into cells. For those therapies, cellular uptake assays may be a release test. However, cellular uptake assays are not needed when the target of the drug is in the blood. Test selection should also be informed by understanding the product. For example, if there are data that trisulfide bonds reform to disulfide bonds in vivo, then it may not be necessary to control trisulfide bonds. Similarly, C-terminal lysines and monoclonal antibodies are generally known um, to not impact the structure and function of monoclonal antibody products, and release testing for C-terminal lysines is not requested. Another consideration for test selection is that critical quality attributes that can change during storage should be evaluated in stability programs. The selection of tests should also be informed by process understanding. That is, knowing what components you put into your manufacturing process, how those components get broken down, and whether your manufacturing process removes those components. For example, release testing of process-related impurities such as methotrexate, insulin, antifoam, host cell proteins, and host cell DNA may not be needed at release 
if removal of those impurities is validated and perhaps monitored in, by in-process testing. I also would like to note here that release testing of those same in-process impurities is generally needed under ND because the manufacturing process is still under development and removal isn't validated. Finally, release and stability testing of primary container closure systems to ensure functionality is also needed. For example, we ask for container closure integrity testing to ensure sterility on stability, and for pre-filled syringes, we ask for break loose and glide force testing. This slide provides the generally expected release test as noted in ICHQ6B, specifications, test procedures, and acceptance criteria for biotechnological and biological products. Some tests are also required by regulations. For example, sterility testing is required of parental products and moisture testing is required for lyophilized products. Now that we've determined what attributes should be tested, we need to decide what analytical methods should be used. One consideration for method selection is the attribute being tested. For example, for sterility testing, you would use a microbiological method, whereas testing of purity and impurities, you would generally use methods that separate components of the mixture in a way that can be measured, or that individual components can be measured. In addition, some attributes may need to be evaluated using more than one method to be fully understood. In those situations, it is expected that the methods will be based on different principles, which we sometimes call orthogonal methods. So for example, um, for impurities testing, it's common to use different methods so that size variance, charge variance, and hydrophobic variance can be evaluated. In addition, it's critical that the analytical procedure is shown to be suitable for its intended purpose. And if the attribute being tested changes on stability, then the me method should be able to detect those changes. Now I want to shift focus and talk about some of the underlying principles for setting the acceptance criteria for specifications. Acceptance criteria are defined as the numerical limits, ranges, or other criteria for the test described. So the question is, how can we set patient-focused acceptance criteria? To address this, at least in part, I want to refer to the Manual of Policy and Proce Procedures 5017.2, on establishing impurity acceptance criteria as part of specifications for NDAs, ANDAs, and BLAs based on clinical relevance. Also for this talk, I will primarily discuss acceptance criteria for products regulated under BLA. First of all, acceptance criteria are frequently set on a case-by-case -case or product-by-product -product basis because acceptance criteria may need to take into consideration the risk of an attribute to product safety and efficacy, the clinical experience with that attribute, and the context of use of the product, such as the dosage form, dosing regimen, route and duration of administration, clinical indication, and intended population. For example, we may allow for higher levels of endotoxin per product dose if that product is going to be administered IV over several hours as compared to being administered over a half hour. In general, the types of data and information provided should be guided by consideration of the clinical impact of impurity levels rather than manufacturing process capability. This will help ensure the acceptance, the acceptance criteria are clinically relevant. However, for biotechnology products, the relationship of impurities to stability, potency, and adverse clinical events may not be clear. And in such cases, we may place more weight on manufacturing process capability when setting acceptance criteria. In general, acceptance criteria should be supported by a risk assessment that includes information on the impact of the impurity on activity, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, safety, and immunogenicity. Data and information can come from a variety of sources, such as clinical, non-clinical, and analytical data, prior knowledge, and publicly available information. Also, it's important to understand that uncertainty about the attribute or quality of the data or knowledge can be a factor in assessing the strength of the risk assessment. Two examples of sources of uncertainty are the strength of the data to understand the clinical effect and the capability of the analytical method used to assess the attribute. We recommend that you apply risk management principle on managing uncertainty to your risk assessment. 
For example, principles that are described in ICHQ-9, which recommends addressing uncertainty through the use of knowledge. In summary, to more fully implement patient-focused acceptance criteria, information is needed to bridge the, cap, the gap between process capability and relevance to the patient. Okay, so now I wanna end with a case study about ex, uh, setting acceptance criteria for a drug that is known to deamidate in, in storage, during storage. So, and the top bar in red is the clinical experience with um, levels of deamidation which also corresponds to this black bar, which represents the manufacturing experience with that product during development. Stability studies indicated that deamidation will continue over time, and the expected change in deamidation over the proposed shelf life is shown here in green and here in red. In the license application, the applicant requested deamidation acceptance criteria as shown here in red. Um, and um, then in, in, um, added to that, um, the uh, expected change in deamidation over shelf life. And so this line in black represents the full range of um, DP end of shelf life acceptance criteria the sponsor requested. And the circled area represents the amount of, um, the range of data or of information that was not uh, shown in, uh, by was not, um, that's beyond clinical and manufacturing experience. To support this request, the applicant provided information from in vivo and ex vivo studies to show that the product rapidly deamidates in blood and that potency is not impacted um, by deamidation. There was also knowledge that this attribute did not contribute significantly to product immunogenicity. The information provided justified the requested range and the proposed acceptance criteria were accepted. So in summary, I'd like to reiterate that patient-focused specifications are a component of end-to-end -end patient-focused product development that includes patient-focused target, target quality product profile, product characterization, a mature manufacturing quality systems, and a manufacturing control strategy that is comprehensive. Patient-focused specification setting includes using the patient-focused target quality profile as a guide in selecting the appropriate tests and analytical procedures and using product knowledge to support the acceptance criteria. However, uncertainty in setting acceptance criteria may arise when the relationship between an attribute and the impact of patients is not clear. Risk assessments can be used to address this uncertainty, but the risk assessment should be supported by data and information. Sources of data and information that can be used to address uncertainty include clinical, in vitro, in vivo, and ex vivo data, prior knowledge, and publicly available information. If uncertainty is not adequately addressed, there may be greater consideration for manufacturing process capability when setting acceptance criteria. So as a closing thought, I'd like to state that OPQ is committed to patient-focused drug development and we encourage sponsors to incorporate end-to-end -end patient focused product development information in their submissions. So thank you for your attention today. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to 2023 Pharmaceutical Quality Symposium. I would like to thank Ray for the nice introduction. My name is Hong Kai, and I'm the Division Director of the Division of New Drug Product 2 in the Office of New Drug Product and the OPQ. My office is responsible for the quality assessment of the small molecule pre-marketing applications and their PRODUFA program, such as INDs and NDAs. Today, I'm excited to be here to discuss our office initiatives in the effort of modernizing quality assessment. In my today's talk, First, I would like to present you the challenges we're facing with the quality assessment of INDs and NDAs. Then I will introduce to you our recent development of CASA for new drug quality assessments. This includes CASA for INDs and the updated features in the CASA for drug substance system. 
CASA represents knowledge-aided assessment and the structured application. Then I will provide a summary of my talk. INDs and NDAs contain the drug development histories. Drug development is a complex and sometimes a long process. As illustrated in this diagram, the drug development from discovery to marketing involves multiple stages. An IND will be submitted to FDA when the sponsor is planning to use the investigational drug first time in human subjects. Subsequently, when new data is collected, there will be amendment, including meetings submitted to FDA. If the drug candidates shows promising marketing potential after going through clinical trials, the sponsor will submit an NDA for marketing application to FDA. Accordingly, the FDA's review of those regulatory submission activities is shown here. This process is a collaboration between the researcher, drug developer, and FDA. For the box highlighted here are the submissions and assessment activities under the respective IND. INDs mainly fall into two categories, commercial or sponsor investigators INDs. The purpose of commercial INDs are intended for marketing their proposed drug products. The sponsor investigator INDs, also referred as research INDs, are for research purpose. Most commonly, the sponsors for research INDs are physicians. There are also expanded access INDs. Both commercial sponsors and the sponsor investigators could submit such INDs. The purpose is for expanded access to an investigational drug for treatment or emergency use for their patients under certain conditions. This table shows the historical IND activities in CEDAR for the years between 2018 to 2022. It is listed in two columns, new INDs and INDs with activities or submissions. The new INDs include both commercial and research INDs submitted at that year. The INDs with activities include the submissions from both new and existing INDs at that year. This table does not include biosimilar biologic INDs, expanded access INDs, and unknown INDs as shown in the footnote. Expanded access INDs are listed in a separate table on the right. The most recently available five years data for expanded access INDs from 2016 to 2020. This data is available on the FDA website as shown here. It is noted that there are more than 10,000 INDs with activities or submissions yearly. In general, the trend of the number of IND related submissions or activities are on the rising. For new INDs, the total number submitted per year is still trending up overall since 2018, with some ups and downs. The highest number submitted in the year of 2020 during this five year period. There is a clear trend of increase of the number of the expanded access IND submissions from 2016 to 2020. Further, there are also approximately 200 NDAs per year for review. As you can imagine, there is a significant quality review task presented to the agency. When a sponsor submits an IND, it will come through Health Authority Gateway as a PDF document. The quality assessment document is also in PDF format. Those PDF documents are stored on Health Authority local servers. They are not easy to search. Additionally, those assessment documents could be lengthy and structured text narrative with critical information dispersed in many assessment documents for a single application. As a result, it is lacking efficient information sharing, knowledge management, and the data analytics among those assessments. From submission point of view, INDs often have long histories. There are numerous types of INDs with various objectives. 
Many research INDs may not be submitted in ECTD formats. The technical complexity of the submission is increasing, such as novel dosage forms, emerging technologies. Most often, the review is under tight timelines in order to bring new drugs to the market for unmet medical needs. The number of submissions are increasing. Therefore, it brings the review challenges with a large amount of information, but often dispersed in multiple places of an IND or NDA assessment. This resulted of difficult knowledge management, hampering holistic review, low efficiency, potentially redundant work, and the inconsistencies. It hinders the effort to produce high quality reviews for stakeholders, such as Congress, pharmaceutical industry, and most importantly, the patients. Therefore, we need to introduce 21st century technology to assist the quality assessment. In 2016, FDA's CASA system was envisioned as a means of modernizing FDA's assessment by utilizing structured data, advanced analytics, and the knowledge management. CASA is the acronym for Knowledge Aided Assessment and Structured Application. FDA's CASA system is a data-based platform for structured quality assessment and applications that supports knowledge management. Instead of a long narrative PDF document, the quality review will be performed using CASA system, which is stored in the cloud server. When fully developed and implemented, the information sharing will be in a standardized and structured format. CASA will enrich the effectiveness, efficiency, and the consistency of regulatory quality oversight through lifecycle management of products and the facilities. CASA system will significantly help the assessors to reduce the time spent for locating information, performing cut and paste, rather by using the time in the critical thinking and the regulatory decision making. Ultimately, CASA will advance FDA's focus on pharmaceutical quality, the foundation for ensuring the safety and efficacy of drugs. CASA for New Drug System is built on the success of CASA for generic, with added flexibility to meet various needs for new drug assessments. It facilitates risk-based assessment and promotes innovation, involved users in all stages of development, from prototype to production, including testing, implementation, and optimization. The chart below provides an update on the current status, efforts, and the plan for future development of CASA for new drug. CASA for drug substance has been developed and completed. It has been implemented for the assessment of new and generic drugs since March 2023. CASA for IND, the internal prototypes, is under testing. In the coming year, we are planning to develop biopharmaceutics, manufacturing, and the new drug product modules for the NDA assessment. When CASA IND system was designed and built, CMC characteristics are taken into the considerations. CMC changes are quite common during IND stages. Meanwhile, some of the INDs share the common CMC information through letter of authorization provided by sponsors. For example, different INDs may share the same API. Same investigational drug product may be studied in multiple INDs for different objectives. INDs could also contain various developmental goals, although many are for marketing purpose, but there are also some for research, expanded access and treatment, as shown in the tables of one of the previous slides. Therefore, CASA IND desired features are flexibility, enhancement of knowledge management, facilitate innovation. In order to ensure CASA system meets the various assessment needs for IND, 
we have designed the CASA IND system with the built-in flexibilities through the module and the block approach. CASA IND contains three modules, overview, drug substance, and the investigational drug product. In each module, there are numbers of blocks to capture the essential background and the CMC information assessments in CASA to ensure a high quality review and the knowledge management. The assessor can select the necessary modules and the blocks based on the content in the submission and the assessment needs. They can select all the available modules and the blocks or some of the modules and the blocks. For example, if a sponsor has made a reference through a letter of authorization to allow FDA to review a DMF in support of the API requirement for their IND. The assessor can select overview and the investigational drug product modules. CASA will record and connect the drug substance assessment to the referenced DMF. The CASA IND system with the structured assessment data will enable the connections of the relevant assessment information from different applications. CASA IND also provides assessors the flexibility to select some of the blocks from each module for an assessment. In another example, when an assessor is reviewing an IND amendment that only contains updated CMC information related to the investigational drug product specification batch data, analytic methods, as well as the stability data for both drug substance and drug product. CASA system will automatically populate the necessary IND background information from previous review. The assessor can focus their time and the resource on the assessment of the CMC changes by only select those relevant blocks and the modules as shown here. For any single IND, the submission contains the drug development history as shown in the diagram. Similarly, CASA will capture the entire quality assessment history for the same IND. Therefore, subsequent reviews can be automatically built on the previous one. It will refresh the assessors with regards to the application history, assist regulatory decision making, and increase efficiency. Additionally, it will also benefit the workload management and the resource planning. CASA can automatically link those INDs who share the same CMC information through a letter of authorization as illustrated in the diagram. This will make it easy to manage and track INDs with shared CMC information through letter of authorization, enable to access previous quality assessments for parent and the doctor INDs easily, optimize assessment and knowledge management, and improve efficiency. Now I'm going to switch gears to introduce CASA for Drug Substance recently added enhancement. CASA for Drug Substance has been added the capability to utilize machine readable structures, SD file for chemical structures. The assessment goal is to quickly identify potentially high risk impurities apply consistent standards for assessment of drug substance information in NDAs, ANDAs, and the DMFs, inform decision-making and the increased efficiency of assessment. Chemical structure data file format that can associate data with one or more chemical structures. Tables of information can be translated into structures, which can then be searched errors are eliminated, easier to transmit structures to other offices or stakeholders within the agency to facilitate multidisciplinary review and collaborations. The chemical structures and the synthetic pathways shown here are pictures or PDF files, and they are not machine readable. On the right side, those are machine-readable GSRS forms. Those structures can be read and searched by the computers. In a desired state, drug substance synthetic routes in CASA can be searched and analyzed. The analytic tools will enable CASA 
to search based on drug substance, reagents, solvents, impurities, and display synthetic pathways. The goal is to identify reaction chemicals that potentially generate high-risk impurities, track global supply chain, identify supply chain vulnerability. For example, if a drug substance is synthesized through three steps of reaction from the starting material, based on the internal build algorithm, the computer can search those structures to identify the high risk of genotoxic impurities, such as nitrosamine impurities. So the assessor can assess whether there is adequate CMC control to ensure the patient's safety. CASA system is a tool to modernize institutional knowledge management, build in data analytics to improve assessment quality, improve assessment efficiency and consistency, inform decision-making and facilitate innovation. Ultimately, it can help to bring more affordable and accessible medicines for American patients. In summary, CASA for new drugs are built using the same approach as CASA for generics, but include unique elements such as flexibility and analytical tools based on the needs of IND and NDA assessments. CASA for IND prototype is undergoing pilot testing to optimize its module for various assessment needs. CASA for drug substance interface has the enhancement features, which has been released in CEDAR IT platform. CASA for new drug enables knowledge management, increases the critical thinking time for the assessor, and promotes consistency and efficiency in regulatory assessment. Before I end my talk, I would like to thank OPQ CASA for IND working groups. OPQ CASA for Drug Substance Working Group, OPQ CASA for Drug Substance Nexus Implementation Group, all developers, super users, testers, and the staff implementing CASA. Our host, the Cedar Small Business and the Industry Assistant Team. And thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm very excited to have this opportunity to discuss how collaboration between generic drug companies and regulatory authorities can accelerate the approval of generic drugs. I will begin by highlighting key challenges faced by both industry and regulatory authorities. By gaining a deeper understanding of each other's situation, we can work together more effectively. Then I will discuss the benefit of industry regulatory collaboration. Following that, I will touch on the agency's effort to strengthen this collaboration and what's expected from generic drug companies. At last, I will conclude by discussing how we can align our efforts to achieve our common goals. For generic industry, you are in a highly competitive environment that requires constant innovation in product formulation and manufacturing process to remain competitive. You must carefully evaluate intellectual property and mitigate risks of patent litigation. And you need to tightly control costs while accelerating product time to market. Now, let's take a look at the challenges FDA is working to address. We are working very hard to ensure that the quality of generic drugs remain top notch as more and more generic products entering the market. We need to improve the efficiency of assessment with our limited resources. We need to work diligently to prevent and address drug shortages so that everyone has access to the medicines they need. At the meantime, 
we need to keep up with the fast pace of science and technology advancement. We have a big task ahead of us, but we are up to the challenges. Both of us are facing a lot of challenges. How can we successfully handle these challenges? Well, the answer is simple, that is collaboration. We had some great success stories that we worked together, like teaming up to fight the pandemic and programs like PEPFAR. When generic companies and regulatory authorities engage in true collaboration, we are able to calibrate expectations, be more transparent and build trust. By keeping the lines of communication open, we can identify and solve problems early. When we take a collaborative problem-solving approach, I believe we can continue to overcome challenges together. Now let's take a closer look at what we are doing from a regulatory standpoint to boost our collaboration with the industry. First, we are committed to modernizing regulatory frameworks. Just as discussed in the previous talk, we are putting CASA, knowledge-aided assessment and structured application into action across the board, covering both generic and brand name drugs. CASA is designed to capture and manage knowledge during the life cycle of a drug product, establish rules and algorithms to facilitate risk identification, mitigation, and communication. For generic drugs, we have already rolled out CASA for oral solid uh, dosage forms, and we are working on expanding its use to liquid dosage forms. We are also putting a strong emphasis on transparency. For example, we currently published the guidance for nitrosamine, drug substance-related impurities. The purpose is to keep it straightforward for our parties involved. Efficiency is a top priority for us, which is why we are currently cross-training our, our review staff for different dosage forms. This ensures that we become more adaptable and agile in our operation. In terms of communication, we are actively creating more opportunities to engage with the industry. This allows us to gain a deeper understanding of the challenges you are encountering and make sure that we are all on the same page. There is no doubt that we have made great progress, but we see this as an ongoing journey. Our goal is to make our collaboration better and better. Constructive communication plays a vital role in fostering trust and ensuring consistency. Now let's explore the various pathways for pre and communication, including control correspondence, Pre and the product development meeting, also referred as PDEF meeting. ANDA pre submission meetings, also referred as PSUB meetings. These channels provide valuable opportunities for us to connect. In the spirit of collaboration, we also have expectations from the generic industry. First, we expect the industry have a thorough understanding of all relevant guidance.
this knowledge is very important for preparing a first class in the pre-meeting package. We also expect any request to be based on solid data rather than unsupported claims. We expect generic companies to carefully select the most appropriate meeting format and communication channel for specific inquiries and ask clear, precise questions. By aligning our efforts, both generic companies and regulators can work together to streamline review timelines and expedite the availability of high quality award, uh, affordable medicines. However, this work requires a mutual commitment from all parties involved. To submit a controlled correspondence, you should follow the draft guidance for industry controlled correspondence related to generic drug development. You also need to check questions and answers on quality related controlled correspondence first at this link. The most frequent controlled correspondence topics have been grouped into different categories and may save you some time. To receive the most accurate and fast response from the agency, it is important to be specific, concise, and clear in stating your inquiry. This clarity helps us to answer your question accurately. In addition, if your questions are multidisciplinary, and require input from another sub-office, your control correspondence will be characterized as a level two instead of a level one control correspondence. This means the time frame for response will be extended from 60 days to 120 days. To avoid delays, please consider separating your questions accordingly. So you may wonder, should I submit a control correspondence or request a PDF meeting? For control correspondence, if your question is just a single question or closely related questions, you should submit control correspondence. And also if your questions are outside of PDAP meeting scope, then you should go with control correspondence. As I said before, control correspondence has two levels, level one and level two, they have different response time. And control correspondence is also good for post PDAP meeting clarification. For PDAP meeting, it is best for multidisciplinary questions. And if you have new questions that are not addressed in the control correspondence, generally PDAP meeting will be held within 120 days if granted. And remember, do not duplicate control correspondence in a PDAP meeting. Pre-ENDA meetings serve two main purposes. First, they help to clarify regulatory expectations from the get-go. Second, they work to improve assessment efficiency, potentially reduce assessment cycles, ultimately speeding up the approval process. It is important to note that about 30% of meeting requests face denial. The primary reasons for these denials are incomplete meeting packages, questions fall outside of the intended scope of the meeting, 
Request for pre-assessment. Questions that do not contribute to clarification. Ensuring your meeting request addresses these factors can significantly improve your chance of a successful pre and meeting. A PDF meeting request will be granted if they can meet the following criteria. It is a complex generic product. There is no product specific guidance PSG available. When a PSG is available, but the applicant is proposing an alternative by equivalence approach. The meeting package is complete, including all generated data and specific proposals for product development. This should include details about proposed development plan, such as an alternative study design, along with just sufficient justification to support the proposal. It is clear that controlled correspondence wouldn't be able to address the questions raised by the applicant uh, adequately. As a suggestion to generic industry, we encourage you to have clear goals in mind when interacting with the agency. Ask specific questions about your program and approach. This will help us provide targeted and effective advice. Justify your proposal with preliminary data. However, no data dumping and avoid assessment issue type questions. For example, do not ask about acceptance criteria for specification, acceptability of the study result. So this criteria, just to ensure that PDAP meetings are granted in situations where they are most beneficial and necessary. When it comes to pre enda meetings, it's important to know that there are two types of meeting, PDAP and PSAP. The choice between them might leave you wondering, and it, it is critical to get it right because submitting a meeting request in the wrong category would lead to a denial. So let's break it down. PDAP meetings are intended for scientific exchange on specific issues. This includes discussion of proposed study designs, alternative approaches, additional study expectations, or any questions you might have. At a PDAP meeting, the FDA provides specific advice on your ongoing and the development program. On the other hand, PSUB meetings provide an opportunity for and the applicants to submit unique or novel data or information to the FDA. This data will be included in the uh, application material submissions. PSUB meetings are typically held six to 12 months before you plan to submit uh, your application. Now let's go over the criteria for a PSUB meeting. We recommend for complex products, you should first seek FDA's input through a PDAP meeting before requesting a PSUB meeting. This ensures that the FDA is aware of uh, the development program at the time of the PSUB meeting. However, you can still request a PSUB meeting, whether or not you have had a prior PDAP meeting. 
FDA will grant a PSAP meeting under the following circumstances. If you had previously been granted a PDF meeting for the same generic complex product. If the FDA determines that a PSAP meeting would enhance the efficiency of the, F the ANDA assessment process. So in short, collaboration is the key to mutual success. Utilize communication channels effectively. Make sure your proposal is focused and well reasoned before submitting them. By following procedures, we can work more effectively to achieve our goals. That concludes my presentation. I will be back a little bit later on the panel to answer your questions. Let's join our hands to accelerate the delivery of high quality generic products to the public. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to my colleagues for their invaluable support. Thank you very much. And thank you all for the great presentations. We're moving into our first Q&A panel. And as a, the audience, if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions via the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll wait, a reminder for all of our panelists to please connect your mic and your video so that we'll be able to bring you up on screen. As a reminder, also to our audience, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. So we're waiting on our presenters to connect their mics and their videos. There may be just a slight delay as we move into this section of the uh, question and answer panel. All right, we're getting some, some of our uh, panelists coming on right now. We'll wait for everything to load very soon. And just for a mic check, we'll, our first uh, few questions will be going out to Dr. Larry Lee. All right, we got another panelist coming on video there. And we've got Dr. Kirshner and Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee's loading, here we see Dr. Lee. And so while the other ones load, ah, there's Dr. Dr. Kai is online. Awesome. And we'll just go ahead and move into our first a few questions for Dr. Larry Lee. And here is the first question for Dr. Lee. Is the structured data and systematic approach to quality assessment a global initiative developed in collaboration with other regulatory agencies? Yes, thank you for, for the question. That is an excellent question. Um, I want to emphasize that, yes, I think uh, the global harmonization in any quality areas are uh, important uh, to us. And then uh, for this uh, structural submission, yeah, we do plan to uh, go through, have uh, international collaboration. We do plan to uh, go through uh, ICH to actually uh, look at, to focus on uh, the so-called structure pharmaceutical uh, submission. Uh, this is part of our future plan. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. Lee. And here is the next question. Will CASA impact the standards for application approval from a CMC perspective? Uh, no, I think that I want to emphasize that CASA is really the internal system to FDA. I do not, uh, basically, I don't think an industry will any, see any differences uh, from externally. Uh, 
because the simply because we are going to apply the same quality standards as well as apply the principles uh, described in the published guidance. Uh, the CASA is really the system to help us to reduce some uh, to do our work internally uh, more efficient and or more consistently. Uh, so I uh, so because of that, it will not have uh, any impact on our review standard. And I also want to emphasize that ultimately, the our assessor is still the one who make the final decision based on the information available in CASA or stream the information streamlined by CASA. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. We do have one more question and also involves CASA. And here is the question, what is the benefit of CASA for industry? Again, I think the, the, the benefit from, 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 the, uh, from our perspective as well as uh, from more uh, enterprise, at the more enterprise level is that CASA allows our assessor to do things more efficiently and consistently so that when industry receive our comments on or our information requests, uh, it will be more consistent. So I think our goal is that uh, to really reduce variability in terms of our communication to industry and the industry, uh, um, uh, therefore the industry will we'll have a more predictability in terms of the, the question and, uh, and the IR request from us. So I think that is definitely a benefit. And then also from our perspective, it will help us to uh, tremend uh, tremendously uh, to do our job more efficiently, then we will continue to be able to meet our user fee commitments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a few questions that came in for Dr. Susan Kirshner. And here is the first question for Dr. Kirshner. Does FDA accept cryo-EM method for large molecule identification? And does FDA keep up with the latest approaches of analytical methods? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think there's two components to that. FDA does keep up with uh, emerging technologies and the latest approaches. And I think Dr. Lee um, spoke a bit about our emerging technology program. And so if you do have an emerging technology that you're, or a, um, perhaps a technology that's been used in under different circumstances is, and is now being applied in a different way, we do recommend you reach out to the Emerging Technology Program and they can help um, shepherd uh, the, the introduction of, an emer of a technology into um, a regulatory uh, use. Um, as far as cryo-EM specifically, I'm not sure I've actually encountered someone trying to use it that way. So in that sense, um, it might be an emerging technology. We um, are open to the introduction of new technologies. You would have to just provide the data in your submission um, to support its use uh, the way you, or its intended use. I don't know, Larry, if put you on the spot, if you wanna say anything more about emerging technologies or, or I've said enough. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I think you're good. Uh, I think your response is good. Thank you, Susan. All right, thank you both for responding to the right question. Moving on to the next question for Dr. Kirshner. And it's asking for Dr. Kirshner, from your perspective, in which phase of development should sponsors discuss their potential PFAC with OPQ? Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming, thank you again for the question. I'm assuming PF there is um, patient-focused acceptance criteria. Um, and, uh, you know, typically you, you probably want to have that conversation somewhere in phase three or in later stage of development um, when you've got enough information about the product and your manufacturing process and stuff um, to, support, to support your acceptance criteria setting. Um, yeah, but you know, we, we don't, 
if you want to come in earlier with a question, you, you could certainly do that. But it seems like it would be most productive later in development. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. Kirshner. And here's the next, uh, next question. In the case mentioned, since potency is not affected by deamination, can the applicant put or use a wide acceptance limit? Um, okay, thank you for that question. And I'm assuming we're talking about a wide acceptance limit for deamidation. Uh, and in the uh, example I gave, um, we also, you know, potency is not the only factor. Immunogenicity uh, can be impacted by a deamidation. Uh, and sometimes um, um, PK can be affected by deamidation. So, you know, you, you would need a comprehensive understanding of the variant or impurity uh, to really uh, to support your your acceptance criteria. Uh, and overall, I would just say um, I'm, I'm going to kind of group because there are a bunch of questions about setting acceptance criteria and, and additional examples. And, and I did give some. Um, and, you know, basically we, you know, with um, glycosylation, with various different components of the molecule, we have accepted um, acceptance criteria that were broader than perhaps manufacturing history or clinical experience when the appropriate information is available. Uh, and I think there's a fair amount of literature, particularly around monoclonal antibodies and the potential impact of different um, variants, deamidation, oxidation, glycosylation variants. You might want to look into that literature to see the kinds of information that people generate to understand how um, different variants um, and uh, impact structure and function. And, and that those would be the kind of data that we would look to to support uh, acceptance criteria. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Dr. Kirshner, and it is the following. Can you please provide any additional examples of situations in which acceptance criteria beyond that shown in manufacturing process capability and clinical performance were accepted. So, like I said, you know, and I think I brought a couple of these uh, up during my my speech. Um, glycosylation, you know, variants if we if they're shown not to impact, you know, ADCC, or if the molecule doesn't have ADCC, then that would be an example. Um, and uh, I think a lot of them do wind up being in, in the glycosylation range um, that we get a lot, sometimes oxidation. But like I said, you, you just have to understand the impact and justify the acceptance criteria, and then, then we'll be willing to talk to you about it. The other thing I want to bring up again is to reiterate um, that you have to have a well-controlled manufacturing process uh, in order for us to be comfortable accepting broader acceptance criteria. So if your manufacturing process isn't well controlled and you don't have mature quality systems, then, you know, we may look a little more closely and be a little bit more um, uh, conservative in our uh, acceptance criteria setting. Thanks. Thanks for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. We've got a few questions that came in for Dr. Hong Kai. And here's the first question for Dr. Kai. With the CASA desired state incorporating machine-readable structure data, is it logical to conclude that the future state should incorporate AI-assisted assessments? Hi, uh, that's a good question. And uh, at this time, we have not utilized AI te technology yet in our CASA IND development but we will continue to explore and embrace new technologies for their potential use and assistance in our quality review to improve efficiency and allow our assessors to focus their time on critical thinking and resolving complex regulatory and technical issues for consistent and high quality review. So we are open-minded. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kai, for responding to that question. We've got a couple more that did come in for you. And here's the next question. 
will the ECTD structure still be applied when submitting information through CASA? As Dr. Lee mentioned, the CASA system is mainly designed for our assessors to use to modernize our assessment as a tool to help improve efficiency and the consistency, as well as managing our knowledge. So at this time, I don't think there is a change yet for ECTD structure in terms of submission. Um, but I like, like I would like Dr. Lee to add if there are any new trends and things and for this question. Thank you. No, I don't think there's any changes. Uh, I think uh, like main, mainly, I think the folks should still uh, follow the uh, M4Q. And then I understand the ICH M4Q is currently under the revision. And then also in the near future, right, we will also focus on uh, international collaboration or more like a structured uh, data submission uh, format, which will be uh, in, uh, used in conjunction uh, to support the M4Q. Uh, M4Q. Uh, I think those uh, efforts will be uh, in part like go, uh, will be going through uh, ICH as well. So, um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question as a group. And we do have one more question for Dr. Kai. And here's the question. When do the NDA applicants need to provide SD files as part of the NDA submission? And is submitting SD files for chemical structures a requirement for CASA? Hi, thank you for the question. Uh, we do encourage you to submit SD file as part of NDA submission, even at this time. However, please keep in mind, submitting chemical structure in SD file is voluntary. It's not a requirement. It is only one of the options to capture synthetic pathway and the impurities in a structured fashion. Even if there's no SD files, we are still capable to capture synthetic pathway and the impurities in a structured fashion. The key is we're trying to use a structured fashion of the submission, then we can use it for our assessment and analysis. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. I had a few questions that came in for Dr. Helen Tang, and here is the first question for Dr. Tang. After receiving a complete response letter for an ANDA, is it possible for industry to submit a controlled correspondence to FDA? Uh, that's a good question. Yes, after receiving a complete response letter for an ANDA, uh, the industry can submit controlled correspondence. And just to see clarification or address any outstanding concerns related to the application. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a few more questions that came for Dr. Tang, and here is the next question. Are there any restrictions or limitations on the number of controlled correspondences that an applicant can make? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the good news, no, there are not any restrictions or limitation on the number of times that the industry can submit control correspondence. As long as the submissions, uh, the control correspondence are relevant, appropriate, and pertain to the application or regulatory guidelines. So the industry can submit controlled correspondence whenever necessary. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got another question, a couple more regarding controlled con uh, correspondences. And here's the next question. How long does it typically take to receive a response to a controlled correspondence? Um, that's a, another good question. The time it takes to receive a response to a control correspondence 
can range from a few weeks to four months, depending on the complexity of the question. So working uh, the workload at FDA and our current uh, priorities. So up to 60 days for level one, control correspondence and 120 days for level two control correspondence. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Dr. Tang. And here is the next one. Is it possible to request meetings with FDA after submitting an application? Um, that's a good question. Yes. Uh, there are various meeting types that can be requested with the FDA. For example, the enhanced uh, middle cycle review meeting and post CRL scientific meeting, etc. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Dr. Tang in this round, and here is the question. It's regarding quality issues, uh, quality related issues. Do you believe that pre-submission development meetings are more effective than controlled correspondences? Um, that's a good question. Well, it depends. PDA meeting allows for direct and real-time interaction with the FDA, uh, facilitating in-depth discussion and immediate feedback. Uh, controlled correspondence, on the other hand, can provide a written communication um, and allowing for specific questions and clarification. The choice between these two really depends on the nature of the issues and the uh, available resources. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Up to the beginning of our panel, we've got another question came in for Dr. Larry Lee. And here's the question for Dr. Lee. What is the future of CMC? And how is industry changing? And also, what are the biggest challenges that we'll face? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think the, the biggest challenges uh, we are going to face in the CMC area is the volume of the submission, especially our post-approval uh, uh, post approval supplement will continue to increase, right? I think uh, the, the speed and also the speed for drug development, uh, including uh, the uh, pharmaceutical development in uh, pharmaceutical quality area will continue to be shortened because we want to make um, we want to really make the drug available as soon as possible to the patients. So in that sense, um, I think the challenges is that how do we actually ensure we do a very effective work in a shortened amount of time, but the resources is still remain to be the same. Um, so what we are trying to do here in the uh, in the near future or in the future, our assessment will continue to focus on continuous improvement and to really utilize the, uh, to take advantage of the IT or the advanced technologies to really help us to streamline, to make sure our assessment uh, is effective as well as, as, as efficient as possible. So I think that is really what we'll focus on, and then CASA definitely is one of the uh, one of the uh, solution we are looking at. But we also continue to look for other ways to do it. Uh, but ultimately, I still want to emphasize that no matter what technology we use, our uh, assessor still will make the final decision, and we will continue to train our assessor to make sure they have up-to-date scientific knowledge so they will be able to apply the risk-based principle uh, to make uh, the uh, appropriate uh, decision to support the approval of uh, important drugs uh, for the United States. Thank you. 
Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question just came in from Dr. Lee and Dr. Larry Lee. And here's a question that's it's referring to one of the slides mentioned submissions going to a cloud environment. What is the long-term vision for submissions to FDA? Uh, will the ECTD software and ESG be replaced by sponsors submitting to clouds shared by regulatory authorities? Yeah, I think I've feel, Hong Kong, feel free also to comment on that. I think it's, this is also in your presentation slide. I mean, that is one of, that, that definitely one of our vision like in fact, I think an industry really want this to happen. I think as far as I'm concerned, uh, by um, and based on the conversation I had with the industry, we certainly uh, support uh, this uh, this vision. Uh, but we will do it collaboratively with industry to see what is the best way to approach it. Uh, Hong Kai, if you have any comment, please feel free to share. Hi, yeah, um, uh, uh, Dr. Lee has summarized as well. This is definitely under the discussion and uh, we have been exploring different ways, but in general, the cloud environment is much more secure. It will be much more versatile. So um, as Dr. Lee uh, elaborated, it's a collaboration between industry and the agency. Thank you for the uh, question. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a question, a couple of questions that came in from Dr. Susan Kirchner. And here's the next question. For some, some of the legacy compendial products, the test methods are with traditional techniques which are not able to fulfill current FD expectations. In that case, if the application holder is going for an update of the new techniques, some challenges are faced to respond to the FDA queries. How can we deal with such cases? Hi, thanks for that question. And um, uh, Hong and you may need to, or Helen can, may need to, to chime in on this one from the small molecule perspective, because my expertise is in biologics. Um, it is uh, not uncommon to have methods updated either during development or, or during, the spot, during the product's life cycle. Um, and so we're pretty accustomed to, to working through that. Uh, it usually requires um, some robust demonstration that the new method and the old method um, or a comparability between the old and new methods. It's not uncommon for the new method, particularly with the purity methods, to start seeing new, new impurities that were not um, seen before. That doesn't mean they were never in the product. It just means, you know, generally the new methods are more sensitive. Um, and the best way to deal with that is to have historic product uh, on hand or to make some de um, course degradation studies and show, you know, that these are impurities that were always there. And then we can talk about the extent to which anything new that we see needs to be controlled. But it's not an uncommon uh, thing and if you're ha having difficulties, you know you're welcome to come in for a meeting. Uh, Hong or, or Helen, do you want to chime in on the small molecules? Hi, Helen. I can go first. Yes. So actually, Susan covered really well, and we do uh, acknowledge the technological advancement, and there are some legacy method. So the key is you need to demonstrate the comparability of your new method is at least equivalent or better than the legacy method. And certainly you should, for any particular method and related to any specification, we do encourage you to come in to discuss with the review team for each of them and to make sure it meets the intended purpose. Helen, you want to add something on that? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Susan and Kai. Actually, Hong, you, you have already covered pretty well, but for generic product, I just want to say, uh, as long as uh, you can validate your method, even though it's not USP method, we always have no issue with that. So don't worry about using any advanced technologies. We actually encourage that you can demonstrate you have a better method. We would like to see it. 
Thank you. I thank you all for responding to that question. We've got a few more questions that came in for Dr. Kirchner. And here's the next question. How does quality systems maturity impact patient-focused specifications? Um, so, as I said uh, earlier, if you want to be able to have specifications that are are not based on manufacturing process capability, then you need a robust quality system that we're confident that, you know, if you're seeing out of trend results, um, even if something is in specifications, you're going to go in and investigate what's going on with your manufacturing system. Uh, and so those are components of, of a mature quality system. Um, statistical process control is a great tool. Uh, that should really be used to monitor quality system, your know, both process performance. And, you know, we would really like to have the focus be on um, the manufacturing process controls being a, a routine component of the manufacturing process and not, uh, end, not you know, through endpoint testing. Uh, and, and if we can get to that place where you have a robust quality system and a robust manufacturing process, then we don't have to um, rely so much on end product point testing to demonstrate that the process is working. We can be more patient focused. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one question. Another one just came in for Dr. Kirshner and here is the question. How are acceptance criteria set if the impact of an impurity is not known? Right, and I, I would um, really refer you to the map, um, I think it's 5017.2, um, because it does have some in-depth discussion about that. And, you know, the bottom line is, unfortunately, if you don't have good information about the impurity, you are likely to be limited to your experience with that impurity or or close to, to that. Um, the more you know about the impurity, if you know what it is or what levels it is, if you understand its toxicity, you know, then we have something um, to, to build off wider specifications. But um, if you don't know anything about it, then it's very hard to justify broader specification, broader acceptance criteria. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, got a couple of questions we'll try to squeeze in the very end for Dr. Hong Kai. And here is the first question. In addition to CASA for INDs, are there, is there any plan to develop CASA for NDA quality assessments? Thank you for the question. Yes, CASA uh, for drug substance, as I mentioned, has been implemented in both ANDA and NDA application quality assessments. It is also our plan to develop other modules such as biopharmaceutics, manufacturing, and the drug product assessment for NDA uh, assessment in the future. And similarly, as we did develop the CASA for INDs, we will adapt existing CASA interface used for generics with a consideration of the needs of NDA assessment in design and the development of those modules for NDA assessment. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got another question for Dr. Kai, and here's the question. Can CASA IND, INDs be used for different types of IND submissions, such as research, commercial, or expanded access? Thank you for the question. So CASA for IND is still under prototype development and the testing. And we are really working hard trying to optimize and make improvements. When it is fully developed under the production stage in the future, it is our intent for CASA IND tool to fit into the quality assessment needs of various IND types such as commercial INDs, research, as well as expanded INDs. So the CMC characteristics during IND stages will be taken into consideration when designing CASA IND to ensure its flexibility 
as well as meet the desired goal of enhancing knowledge management. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Another question on CASA for Dr. Kai is the following. Does CASA IND use artificial intelligence technologies? At this time, no, we have not utilized that yet, but we are open for all kind of new technologies. So in the future, everything is possible, but we would make sure as Dr. Lee mentioned, it's still the human power, it's the assessor making the decision, not the machine. It's our qualified um, assessment team put every all the data together to make the holistic view and make the, based on the totality of the data to make the risk benefit, benefit and the science driven decisions. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're gonna give doc, bring in Dr. Kirshner back in to see if she can comment on CASA for BLAs. All right, so I just wanted to mention that um, there are CASA mod modules that already have been launched internally for reviewing, um, for, you know, in the CASA format, and we're, we're developing additional modules for, for unit operations, um, and we're very excited about that. And so, um, you know, CASA, the CASA program has expanded both um, to small molecules and large molecules, uh, and we're very excited. Thanks. Well, that's all the time we have for questions in our Q&A panel. And a huge thank you to our presenters and panelists for answering numerous questions that came in and being live there on camera. This takes us into our lunch break until 1 p.m. Eastern. Please enjoy your lunch.